Okay. So, uh, Libby, <laughs> you're, um, I will give a short introduction first. Okay. So, <laughs> herzlich willkommen zu unserem Vortrag uh, von Elisabeth Schrader-Polzer. Sie ist derzeit uh, eine PhD-Kandidatin an der Duke University in Durham in North Carolina und demnächst ab August, hat sie gesagt, um, in Philadelphia an der Villanovia Universität, wo sie als Assistentin ähm, arbeiten wird. Sie forscht derzeit über Maria von Magdala, insbesondere um Johannes Evangelium unter textkritischer Perspektive. Vor ihrer akademischen Karriere war sie viele Jahre erfolgreich als Singer-Songwriterin. Also, <lacht> falls ihr Lust habt, schaut mal bei YouTube nach, ihren tollen, nach ihrer tollen Musik. Gut, dann Libby, let's start with your presentation. Thank you for coming. Danke, Nicole, und danke, Leipzig, für die Einla Einladung. <laughs> That's the extent of my German for the day, and I apologize for that. Um, I will do my best to speak slowly, and if there are any questions um, at the end, uh, I think Nicole can translate them, and if anything I've said has not been clear, please feel free to follow up on that. Um, I hope the closed captioning works as well. So yeah, so this, um, what I'm going to be presenting today is uh, the content of an article that I published in 2017 in the Harvard Theological Review. And the name of the article is, was Martha of Bethany added to the fourth gospel in the second century? If anyone wants to read an open access, uh, you probably have access to the article through the University of Leipzig, but if anyone needs an open access copy, they can put their email address in the chat and I will send it to them. So it's basically, I'm presenting today, basically the content of this peer reviewed article. So um, what you're looking at in front of you is a picture of Papyrus Bodmer II, more commonly known as Papyrus 66. It was discovered in 1952 near Dishna, Egypt, and today it's held at the Bodmer Library in Coligny, Switzerland. Um, it is a codex containing only the Gospel of John, and it is arguably the oldest extant copy of, the oldest surviving copy of John chapters 11 and 12. It is usually dated to about 200 AD, though it's paleographically dated, so it's impossible to know exactly what the date is. There are about 450 corrections made to this copy in total. That's a lot of corrections. Although the majority of these corrections are due to scribal error, there are also dozens of alternate and important readings that are found in other witnesses like Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Washingtonianus, and Church Fathers. It appears that this scribe had access to two Vorlagen, two exemplars, and that's going to be important as I continue the argument down the line. So um, the scribe copies from one uh, Vorlag and uh, corrects against the other. So the scribe has access to two copies of the Gospel of John that are now lost to us. Um, so my study is focused on chapter 11. This is the story of, in John, of course, Lazarus being raised from the dead. And in Papyrus 66, there is an interesting set of variations around the names Maria and Marta. And it, these variations happen for a long time for five verses from John 11, one through five. So um, in this study, I, I, uh, for, the, for the published article, I looked at about 150 manuscript transcriptions of the gospel of John, but I have now looked at about 280 copies of the Gospel of John. And um, the, the data shows that about 20% or one in five manuscripts of the Greek manuscripts has some sort of problem around Martha. Martha is sort of inconsistent uh, in one in five manuscripts. And in the old Latin, Vetus Latina, um, in 30% of the manuscripts, nearly one in three, there is a problem around Martha. 
So the argument here is the possibility, oh, I also looked at manuscripts of the Gospel of Luke, about 150, 160 manuscripts of the Gospel of Luke in Greek and Latin, and zero have any confusion on the identity of Mary and Martha, 0% in the Latin transmission. It's only in the Gospel of John that there seems to be a problem around Maria and Martha's identities. Um, so the this the argument here is the possibility that Martha in John's gospel may have been added later. Someone who read Luke's gospel, chapter 10, Maria and Martha and Jesus goes to their house and Mary sits at Jesus's feet. That's story in Luke's gospel. My argument is that possibly someone who knew that story in Luke took the character Martha and put her into John. And that would have happened at a very early stage. So this is a big hypothesis. And now I will show you um, the data that is why I have this hypothesis. So let's start with um, John 11.1 1 in Papyrus 66. So the scribe first wrote a nonsense reading. It was, there was a certain sick man Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and of Mary, his sister. You can see here that um, there has been a correction. Marias, Kai Marias, this, this here was an iota. And the iota has been changed to a theta. In Greek, the difference between Maria and Martha is one letter. So iota has been changed to theta. So now it says Maria sky Marthas, Mary and Martha, Maria und Martha. Also in this manuscript, it said um, Adelphes Autu, his sister, but it has been changed to Adelphes Autes, her sister. So the scribe originally wrote Mary, Maria, his sister and changed it to Martha, her sister. Okay. So, you know, these are small changes and the scribe, as I mentioned, makes a lot of mistakes. So maybe the scribe just made a mistake. Um, that would be, that is a possibility, though it's interesting that another very important manuscript, Codex Alexandrinus, has a very similar change. So Codex Alexandrinus is a fifth century magiscule held um, at the British Library, I believe. And this one is very important because the scribe originally wrote something sensible. It was not a nonsense reading. The scribe wrote, there was a certain sick man, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, Maria, his sister. You can see here, Lazarus apo Bethanias ectes. And you can see here that a word has been added in the margin, comes. That word means village. And probably what happened, and this is not my work, this is other people's looking at the manuscript and deciding what happened here. The word comes was probably here originally, comes. It probably said comes tes marias. You can see that the iota was again changed to a theta, the village of Mary. And you can see it also said tes adelphes autu, again, his sister. This manuscript also originally said, Mary, his sister. But again, it has been changed. You can see that the word comes was erased, and now it appears up here. They changed the location of the word comes, village. And that allowed to make room for the extra name. So Marias Kai Marthas, okay? So now there's a second woman. You can also see that the letters are smaller here. The letters are very wide. 
here, here, and here, the letters are big. But in this part where the text was erased and where Martha was added, you can see that the letters are smaller. That's because they had to add Kai Marthas. Or you could say they added Marias Kai and then they changed Marias to Marthas. So this scribe originally wrote, there was a certain sick man, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, his sister. Unlike Papyrus 66, this is a sensible reading, but the text has been changed. Now it says there was a certain sick man, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and of Martha, his sister. Notice that this scribe keeps Adelphes Autu. It is still his sister. In Papyrus 66, his sister was changed to her sister. So I'm very interested in these two manuscripts, both changing Maria to Martha. And they both said, Maria's tes Adelphes autu, Mary, his sister. That's what they both said in their first transcription. Okay, you could again say, okay, Maria, Martha, they're very similar names, perhaps just another mistake, common mistake. But this is the most important change um, in Papyrus 66. In fact, uh, people like Gordon Fee, Marie-Emile Boimard, big text critics in the 1960s, when they looked at Papyrus 66 and its 450 corrections, they said, this may be the most interesting change in the entire papyrus. What has happened here in John 11 verse three is that a woman had a name. Jesus was only interacting with one woman. She has been split into two women. She now appears as two women. So you can see here that um, a pestilen, the singular, the epsilon has been changed to an alpha. So that makes it plural. A pestilen becomes a pestilon sent plural, so two sisters, right? And then we get the woman's name. You can see there that there is the row of her name, whether it was Maria or Martha is difficult to know because as you can see, it has been completely scratched out. This was probably the row of her name. This was the alpha of her name. So Maria, we don't, Quite know what her name was, but it has been replaced with the words Hi Adelphi. And you can see the iota has been kind of squished in there. Hi Adelphi, the sisters. So she had a name, her name has been erased, and it has been replaced with Hi Adelphi, the sisters. You can also see at the end of the line, there's an iota that is actually, if you were to look at the whole page, this one is the furthest to the right. This iota has probably been added because it changes the participle legusa. It changes it from singular to plural. So they are saying, before it was just she is saying, if without the iota, it's one woman, but the iota has been added. So now there's multiple women. Basically, there's three big changes here, and it splits one woman who had a name into two women who don't have names. It's just Hi Adelphi, the sisters. So therefore, the sisters sent to him saying, this is an undisputable change of meaning, and it cannot be explained by the habits of the scribe of Papyrus 66. It is just a change, a woman has been split into two. Um, so this is not the only manuscript, again, where there are interesting things happening in John 11, verse three. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of the first printing of the King James Bible. Um, the first printing says only one sister. Therefore his sister sent unto him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Um, this is not a typo, 
it's also found in the 1526 Tyndale Bible and the 1591 Bishop's Bible. So the first editions in English said one sister. However, the second printing of the King James Bible says his sisters. So I, I think this is interesting because both in the first and the second printing of the King James Bible, we are not sure if there's one or two sisters. First printing one sister, second printing two sisters. Also in Papyrus 66, the oldest copy we have, we're not sure, is there one sister or is there two sisters? The first copying is one sister, the second, the correction is two sisters. So there's sort of an instability around the second sister in this verse. Um, now let's look at John 11, verse four. This is for people who know Greek. I'm guessing that most of you know Greek. Could you raise your hand if you know Greek? Yeah, good. Okay, very, very good. For those of you who don't know Greek, I apologize in advance. <laughs> this one's a little bit of a, a Greek moment. This, this correction has to do with this little pen stroke here called a hypodiastole. Um, it sort of functions like a comma um, in, in, uh, as that, we would, that we would be used to. It kind of forces a break in the text. So um, this has to do with the word here, um, alpha, upsilon, tau, eta. And there's no accent marks, as you can see in these. It's just scripto continua in these really, really old manuscripts, just one letter after another. So there's no punctuation, really, and there's no accent marks. Later manuscripts get accent marks, as I will show you. Um, but what's really interesting, so this originally said, Akusas de ho Jesus, when Jesus heard a pen, he said, and then it's this word. Now, for those of you who know your Greek, <laughs> you know that this word could be either the nominative feminine, haute, or it could be the dative feminine, aute. And it depends upon the accent, but we don't have accent marks here. What's really interesting here is that the scribe apparently first thought that this word was the dative feminine singular. And you can tell because, so the dative feminine singular would be translated to her, to her. Whereas the nominative feminine singular would be this. Obviously two different translations. And how that looks, if it were the dative feminine singular, it would say, when Jesus heard, he said to her, one woman, pause. The sickness is not unto death, but it is for the glory of God in order to glorify the son through it. Notice that there is a pause just before Jesus begins speaking. However, remember the scribe literally just he just split a woman in two. <laughs> this just happened. This is one verse earlier, okay? The scribes took one woman and split her into two women. So if Jesus is talking with one woman, he said to her, but then you split it into two women. Okay, now he's talking to two women. Look what happens here. When Jesus heard, he said, comma, this sickness is not unto death but it is for the glory of God. Notice that when you add the hypodiastole, when you add the comma, it changes the meaning of this word. Aute becomes haute. This sickness is not unto death. And of course, this causes the word that Jesus speaks to change. So it seems like, uh, you know, maybe you shouldn't be changing the words that Jesus spoke. <laughs> But that is exactly what the scribe has done. By adding this hypodiastole, it causes a break in the text so that Jesus begins speaking here instead of here. And the correction makes it so that Jesus is no longer speaking with just one woman. If this were the dative feminine singular, Aoti, 
Jesus would be talking to one woman, to her, right? But the scribe doesn't want him to be speaking to, to one woman anymore because the woman has been split in two, right? So by adding the hypodeistole, this doesn't refer to the woman anymore. It now refers to the sickness. This sickness is not unto death. I hope that's clear. I know it's tricky for people who don't speak Greek, but I hope for those who love their datives and their nominatives <laughs> that this was a lot of fun. And it just goes to show why it's important to learn Greek. Okay, so now let's go to verse five. This is the last verse in Papyrus 66 that shows problems around Martha. And it you'll notice that for the first time, Martha is there. She's there in the manuscript for the first time. So it says, uh, this is right after where we just were. So um, uh, we just saw uh, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God in order to glorify the son through it. And right afterwards you get Jesus loved Martha and the sister and Lazarus. So a couple things here. First of all, Martha is here. She shows up for the first time. Before this, Martha was only in the manuscript by way of correction, right? So Martha was in verse one because the iota was changed to a theta. Verse two is about Mary. Verse three, probably this woman's name was Maria that was crossed out. We can't be certain, but that seems to make the most sense considering that Martha is the problematic person in these, in these text critical problems. So the second sister, probably Martha, has only been included again because of these corrections. And verse four, this little comma erases the possibility that there's only one sister. So Martha, she finally shows up here. Martha. Jesus loved Martha. Martha, okay? Accusative, right? But what's really interesting is that the scribe hesitates on saying that Martha is Mary's sister. Notice that it just says Jesus loved Martha, Kai, Tain, Adelphine, Martha and the sister. Whose sister? Whose sister? Lazarus' sister, Martha's sister. The scribe does not answer. It just says Jesus loved Martha and the sister and Lazarus. But you can see that the scribe has also made a little marginal correction, okay? And this kind of correction indicates that different manuscripts say different things. That's what that sort of correction means in antiquity. Martha and the sister of her. Martha and her sister, Tain Adelphine Autes, okay? So you can see here, again, there's sort of a question as to whether Martha is Mary's sister, but the scribe corrects it to read what your Bible would say today. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So my theory about what has happened here is that remember I mentioned that the scribe has access to two forlagen, right? And um, that's something that people who have studied Papyrus 66 have said for a long time. The scribe has two copies that are now lost to us. My theory is that one copy had Lazarus and Mary only, and the other copy had Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. So the scribe has two copies and the scribe has to decide which copy am I going to use? The one with Lazarus and Mary or the one with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And if you think about it that way, it makes sense of all these changes, right? The scribe kind of doesn't want to name Martha at first, but then sort of decides to here and changes his sister to her sister. The scribe first writes the one woman, but then says, okay, I'm gonna split her into two women. So the scribe is sort of negotiating, negotiating the two different forms of the text. This is just a hypothesis, but to me, it would make sense of what's happening here. Obviously verse four, 
the scribe changes the meaning of the word aute to haute. Again, because Martha is getting included. And remember, John 11.5 is a list of the Bethany siblings. And I think this is the spot where the scribe has to decide. Will I use the version with only Lazarus and Mary? Or will I use the version with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha? It's very interesting. You'll see that the scribe stops at the end of verse four, stops again, writes the first letter of the word igapa, just the first letter, and then stops again. I think that this point right here might be where the scribe says, okay, I decide I'm going to use the copy with Martha in the middle of this stop. Of course, maybe the scribe just had to go to the bathroom. This is a very long time ago. <laughs> Who knows for sure? But this is just my idea of why you might get these stops in this exact place. It's because possibly the scribe says, okay, I'm going to include Martha. And that is why Martha shows up for the first time here in John 11, verse 5. Now, again, this is um, a verse that there's lots of problems not just in Papyrus 66. I'm going to show you now a fifth century copy in Latin. If you don't do Greek, this is probably a little bit easier. You can see what it says. Uh, at least the, the, the alphabet is the same. Um, this says Jesus, uh, Jesus, diligabat Jesus. Jesus loved Lazarum. So notice that this Lazarus is listed first of whom Jesus loved. And it's a bit strange. If you were to look at your Bible, your Bible says Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Look how different this is. It says Jesus loved Lazarus and Mary and her sister. That's just so different from what your Bible would say. In your Bible, Martha is first. The sister is second. And Mary does not get a name in your, in your copy in your Bible. And Lazarus is last. This is totally different, okay? Totally different order of names and who is named. You will also see here that someone has added Martha's name hundreds of years later. This is a fifth century copy, unctual hand. This is a Carolingian minuscule. Ah, that's probably difficult to translate into German, but maybe the words are close enough. Carolingian minuscule hand. The handwriting is, the schrift is much, uh, much later, hundreds of years later. So you can see that um, whoever copied this in the fifth century did not think that Martha's name needed to be included in the verse. And it's only someone maybe from the eighth century that decides that Martha should be named. So now the correction says, Jesus loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha her sister. Okay. Um, there's also a very interesting copy of La sorry of Chrysostom's homilies. Some of you may know that John Chrysostom's homilies mostly survive in Byzantine later manuscripts. This is, I think, an 11th century manuscript. Um, and all the manuscripts of Chrysostom's homilies, uh, homily 62 is the one where he talks about the resurrection of Lazarus. In these homilies, there's something that's called a uh, lemma, which is when John Chrysostom quotes the biblical text. He provides the quote from the verse, and then he talks about it. Now, every single copy of this homily, except for this one, they all say Jesus loved a, a Martha, and her sister and Lazarus, just like your Bible, right? I think it's uh, Martha and Kai tes Adelphes autes Kai uh, Laz Kai ton Lazaron. That's what it usually says. That's what all the other manuscripts say. But this one copy, this is the copy of John Chrysostom's homily held at St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai. So this is a Sinai manuscript. Only in this one copy, the lemma is different. The quote of the biblical text is different. In this one, 
it says Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters. Lazaron kai tais tas adelphas autu. Lazarus and his sisters. Again, very different from what your Bible says because Lazarus is first and the sisters are not named at all. Neither sister is named. And what's most important about this manuscript is that it is in Greek. The, the gospels are written in Greek and John Chrysostom wrote in Greek. So there's no translation here. He's just quoting. This suggests that maybe in the fourth century, John Chrysostom had a copy of John 11 verse five that said, Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters. Lazaron kaitas adelphas autu. Very, very different. Very, very different from the Greek text in our Bibles today. And this is the one that I am the most interested in. This is another old Latin manuscript, Codex Colbertinus. This one, it's Vedas Latinus 6. It's held in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. It says, Jesus loved Lazarum et sororem eius, Lazarus and his sister. One sister, only one. So um, what I think is perhaps the most interesting thing, this is a very important manuscript as of course our Codex of uh, Alexandrinus and Papyrus 66. And what I find to be most interesting is that if you put these manuscripts together, look, you have a different text of John 11. I'm sorry, this is in English. I should have maybe put it in Greek or even German. <laughs> but this is a this is what is called an eclectic text. It is not a conjecture. A conjecture would be me just sort of giving my best guess of what I thought maybe John 11 said. Um, that's not what this is. This is an eclectic text because it is real readings in real manuscripts. The three manuscripts are very important. Codex Alexandrinus, Papyrus 66, and Codex Colbertinus. So if you have a Bible or if you want to look on your phone, at what John 11 says, I'm going to read this version and you can compare it to what Bibles today would say. There was a certain sick man, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, his sister. Now this was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, Mary sent to him saying, Lord, behold, the one you love is sick. But when Jesus heard, he said to her, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, so that the son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Lazarus and his sister. So this is quite a substantial chunk of text that can be reconstructed from real manuscripts with Martha not there. Um, and so why does this matter? Probably, maybe some of you have uh, heard about this research before, and so maybe you know where this is going. <laughs> but if not, you might be wondering, well, why would somebody want to add Martha to this story? That's really the question here, right? So um, I also want to emphasize that it's not only the first five verses that this happens. People sometimes ask me this to say, oh, it's only in the first five verses. Not at all. It's only in the first five verses of Papyrus 66. But if you look throughout the text transmission, you see it could happen anywhere that Martha appears. This is later in Codex Colbertinus in John 11, verse 20. You can see again. Maria changed to Martha. This is how you do it in Latin. You don't change any yoda to a theta. <laughs> you change an I to a T and then you put an H above it. Okay, Maria changed to Martha. It wasn't, this was not a T you can tell because see, this is what the T's look like. It was an I, definitely. Maria changed to Martha in John eleven twenty. 20. At Duke, I am at Duke University right now. Duke has a, a lot of Greek manuscripts, uh, 12th century, 11th century Byzantine manuscripts. And look, 
Duke has one. It's, as I mentioned, it's one in five manuscripts. It's literally in the entire text transmission. If you have a copy of, if, if you know five manuscripts of the Gospel of John, or let's say even 10 manuscripts, maybe somewhere nearby in Germany, I know that there's a lot of copies here. I'm telling you that approximately one in five of them will have something funny around Martha. So here, um, this one was an iota. You can tell because um, the accent mark has been erased. So this is what an iota looks like, right? And there's the accent mark. So iota has been erased and it was changed to a very narrow theta. This is what Martha is supposed to look like. Martha, the accent mark is on the first syllable usually. This is one of those later manuscripts that includes accent marks. So Martha is down here. That's what the theta is supposed to look like. But you can clearly see that this was Maria. And the iota was erased, including the accent mark, and changed to a theta. OK? So another Maria changed to Martha in this 12th century manuscript. Really, it's happening everywhere. Also, you know, people say, but what about John chapter 12, where Martha serves the supper? Everybody knows that Martha serves. That's how we know her from Luke chapter 10 and, and John chapter uh, 11, or sorry, John chapter 12. But it depends on the manuscript. There are a bunch of minuscules, later ones, 12th century, but they say, He Maria diacone, Mary served. This is that very important verb, diacone. For those of you who study New Testament, I'm sure you know the um, exegetical theological significance of this verb. Uh, diakonos, diakone. Um, and so here, Mary is the one who is doing the serving in these manuscripts. So she first serves the supper and then anoints Jesus in these manuscripts. Okay. So why are we going to add, <laughs> why would somebody add Martha to the story? And um, I think what it really comes down to is uh, how, how similar Lazarus's sister Mary is to Mary Magdalene in the Gospel of John. Um, this is just, of course, a hypothesis, but we know that many people from the very beginning understood Mary of Bethany to be the same woman as Mary Magdalene. We see Hippolytus of Rome making that conclusion. The Manichaeans make that conclusion. Um, Ambrose makes that conclusion. And it might be because the Gospel of John crafts these interesting parallels between the Lazarus story and the story in John chapter 20, the encounter between Jesus and Mary Magdalene in the garden. Of course, both women are named Mary. Both women are crying. Notice that in John chapter 11, Jesus asks, Putethekate auton, where have you laid him? Mary Magdalene asks Jesus in chapter 20 when she thinks he's the gardener. She uses the exact same verbs and pronouns. Pu ete kas auton, where, have you, where you have laid him, right? So it's sort of like a mirror question. Jesus asks Mary, Mary asks Jesus. The story happens at a tomb in both chapters. There is a stone in both chapters. There is a handkerchief in both chapters. Um, both Mary and Martha say, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It says 1121, but it's also in 1132. Did anyone ever notice that uh, Mary and Martha say the exact same thing? They both say, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. John 11, verse 21. John 11, verse 32. Um, I don't know if this will translate into German, but uh, did anybody ever watch The Matrix when the cat goes by twice and they call it the glitch in the matrix? Does anyone know what I'm referencing here? I don't know if it'll work. <laughs> okay. When, when the cat walks by twice in, in the matrix, they say that's when something has been changed in the matrix. And so I say, okay, when she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. She says it twice. That's the glitch in the matrix. She says, uh, it's, it's, it's like maybe an indication that something has been changed. And that's actually what a lot of redaction critics thought uh, in the 90s when People were doing that sort of work on the Gospel of John, redaction criticism, form criticism. 
Some people thought that that exact duplicate quote indicated that something had been changed. And of course, Jesus speaks about go to my brothers in John chapter 20. So there's all these parallels. Um, if you were not thinking about the gospel of Luke, Martha, of course, draws you into the gospel of Luke. Martha makes you think of that other story. If you were only reading the gospel of John by itself, you would notice how similar Lazarus's sister Mary is to Mary Magdalene, this woman named Mary who cries at a tomb and sees someone rise from the dead. Very similar. Maybe you wouldn't notice it the first time you read the Gospel of John, but the second or the third time you might notice. There's also this part in John chapter 12, where Mary um, anoints Jesus and uh, Judas complains. And Jesus says, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial right? This is Lazarus's sister, Mary. But there's only one woman named Mary who goes to Jesus's tomb in this gospel, Mary Magdalene. So I wouldn't say that the author of John explicitly states, oh, Lazarus's sister, Mary is Mary Magdalene. I don't think that is there at all. But I do think that the author of John has deliberately put the question in your mind is Lazarus's sister Mary the same woman as Mary Magdalene? There are enough parallels between the two stories to open the question to the sensitive reader who has read the gospel a few times. So why would you add Martha? Because if you put Martha in this story, you are less likely to notice how similar Lazarus's sister Mary is to Mary Magdalene in John's gospel. Instead, you get distracted into Luke. And you say, oh, I know the sisters, Mary and Martha. I remember them, right? Martha is in the kitchen. She's cooking. <laughs> Mary's sitting at Jesus's feet. I love those sisters. I'm a Mary. I'm a Martha, you know. So you get all excited about that story of those two women, you know. And now Lazarus's sister Mary is not Mary Magdalene anymore. Not at all. Now she's Martha's sister. She's a different Mary when you add Martha to the story. But has anyone ever noticed that in Luke's gospel, Martha and Mary have no brother, kein Bruder. <laughs> I hope I said that right. They have no brother in Luke's gospel. I'm saying maybe Mary and Martha in Luke, who are in the north, they seem to be in Samaria or Galilee in that gospel. Maybe they are a totally different family than Lazarus and Mary in John's gospel. Martha and Mary are in the north. Lazarus and Mary are in the south. Um, so that is one possibility here. But here's, oh, sorry, there's John 20. I should have shown you that earlier. This is the Mary Magdalene scene, <clears throat> right? Okay. But this is what I think it really comes down to. What is Martha's primary role in the gospel of John? She utters the confession, the Christological confession, right? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. You believe this. Who is Jesus talking to? I don't know if it's the same in Germany. In Germany, people are much better about their Bibles than most places. But in America, people know that quote from Jesus, but they forget who he's talking to. The person he's talking to is forgettable. It's easy to forget whoever he's talking to. Even though that woman says the central Christological confession in this gospel Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. That is understood to be the central Christological confession in this gospel. Did you know that Tertullian, in his treatise Against Praxius, every single copy of Against Praxius said that Maria gave that confession. Maria confessed Jesus as the Christ. Tertullian wrote that around 210 AD, around the same time Papyrus 66 was copied. So I think that this might be what's going on. This might be the central point. Who confesses Jesus as the Christ? 
in the Gospel of John? Is it a forgettable character, Martha, a minor character? That's how your Bible has it today. Or was it Mary? Could it have been Mary who said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one coming into the world? For readers of John's gospel who thought that Lazarus' sister, what Mary, was Mary Magdalene, and we know people did think that, that would have been a different kind of gospel of John, a gospel of John where Mary is a central character throughout the entire gospel. That means Mary confesses Jesus as the Christ. She then anoints Jesus. She then stands by Jesus at the cross. She is the first and the only person to go to the empty tomb. And the only the first person to go to the empty tomb. And then she gets the first appearance of the risen Jesus. And then he commissions her to go and spread the gospel. She's the first one who gets that. That would make Mary, Mary Magdalene, a central character in the gospel of John. It would also make her sort of a threatening character <laughs> to how Peter is presented, right? In Matthew's gospel, who gets the Christological confession? Of course, in Matthew 16, it is Peter who says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Peter gets a big reward. Peter gets a big reward. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. You are Peter on this rock. I will build my church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. These are big things that Peter gets for recognizing Jesus as the Christ. So someone who knew Matthew's gospel, um, who, had, who maybe was reading Matthew and Luke's and Mark's and John's gospel, might have seen that this characterization of Mary, again, it's hypothetical, of course, but I'm saying if Martha were not there, then Lazarus' sister Mary would be far better understood uh, as Mary Magdalene, far more easily understood as Mary Magdalene. And if she gives this Christological confession, that makes her a threatening figure because then she has a role in John's gospel that is just as important as Peter's role in Matthew's gospel. So you can see a motive for the addition of Martha. It makes sure, it ensures that the Christological confession is not on Mary Magdalene's lips or that it can't be read that way. So again, it's just theoretical. I'm just going to close here by showing you a few of the earliest pieces of artwork of the Lazarus story. Fourth century sarcophagi, the standard iconography is one sister. This is a fifth century reliquary, again, one sister. This is the Andrew's diptych. It's based on fifth century artwork. You see Jesus and his wand, it's very old. And this is not Martha. This is one sister. This is somebody else, not Martha, okay? So I think that there's reason, there's enough evidence for us to wonder whether Martha has been added to the text. So, um, in conclusion, I believe that these changes cannot be dismissed as scri scribal mechanical errors because there are so many strange changes around Martha throughout the entire text transmission. I believe early scribes wished to harmonize the Johannine text to the story of Mary and Martha in Luke's gospel. The question is, who added Martha to this story and why? Is it possible that one Mary in the fourth gospel, one woman has been deliberately split into three. So I hope that this paper is a contribution to and an invitation for future dialogue about how Martha affects our perception of Mary of Bethany. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. And uh, we are looking forward to questions too, but um, first I stop there.